Hello, this is Mike Simpson. Welcome to our presentation on software defect management. Ideally, the software that you build will be high quality and will be free from defects. But in reality, software is built by humans, which means there's going to be some problems with it. We want to be able to manage software problems when they occur, be able to track them, and fix them. And so this presentation is going to be talking about the process of identifying and managing problems that occur in software, or as we term it, software defect management. The unauthorized reproduction or distribution of this copyrighted work is illegal. Criminal copyright infringement, including infringement without monetary gain, is investigated by the FBI and is punishable by up to five years in federal prison and a fine of $250,000. If you have questions or comments regarding any of the content covered during this presentation, please use the question and comment box that's located below. Okay, let's get started. We're going to be talking about several different items during this presentation. First, we're going to be talking about the mechanism that's used to help capture software defects. And again, software defects refers to software anomalies, situations where the software does not perform as expected. Now, it could be because of a bug in the software. It could simply be because the software performs as far as the requirements go, but it doesn't perform the way the users expect it to. But in either case, it's defective in the sense that it doesn't live up to users' expectations. So we need to capture that information where the software is not performing up to the user's expectations. And then we need to have a mechanism for reporting and tracking that knowledge that the software is not performing up to the user's expectations. And then we need to be able to analyze that information and then be able to respond to it, whether we need to report back to the users that, yes, the software really is doing what it's supposed to be doing, or no, it isn't doing what it's supposed to be doing, and here's how we're going to fix it. So, one or the other. First, let's take a look at the mechanisms involved. First, what are we talking about when we talk about software defects? Then, how do we capture that information? How do we report and track it? And how do we analyze it? Software defect tracking is a critical aspect of software quality. Because, as we mentioned earlier, while we endeavor to design our software um, to be as high quality as possible, software is designed by humans, and it is built by humans, which means that there's going to be something that slips through. So it's critical that we keep track of any reported problems that occur. Defect tracking and defect management needs to be understood by everyone that has a stake in the success of the software and that includes the management of the company that develops the software, that includes the developers and the designers and the architects that have a stake in the creation of the software, and that includes the end users that wind up using the software. These are all people that have a stake in the success of the software. And so everybody has to understand that it's important to keep track of and to promptly report any problems that may occur. Not only do we have to keep track of them, we have to prioritize them so we know which are the ones that are really important and need to be fixed first, and which are the ones that are annoying and granted should be fixed, but can wait until the real showstoppers get fixed. Then we have to validate those problems, make sure that they are repeatable as opposed to sort of once-off uh, problems. And then once they've been validated and fixed, then we need to close them to indicate, yes, we found the problem, we verified the problem, here's a solution to the problem, we've implemented the problem, we verified the solution. So we have to track, prioritize, validate, and close our defects. Now, we'll of course want to create some sort of a database or other tracking mechanism to record our analysis. The first thing we need to do is to rule out both false positives and false negatives. 
We've all had situations where, for whatever reason, we have tried to type something in at the keyboard, and the system has said, this input is incorrect, and we've retyped the same input, and the same inputs come back in. It's some sort of cosmic glitch. We have no idea what's happened. We can, we can be completely positive that we type the exact same thing, and it's just the way it is. So we need to rule out situations that are false positives. So if it's, something, if it's not something that we can duplicate, then unfortunately we can't, there's nothing really to fix. <laughs> and sometimes those things happen. That can be a false positive. And we also want to rule out false negatives. I mean, sometimes it really is a bug, even though it's not obvious. Most of the time we have false positives. Sometimes we have things that appear to be bugs and aren't. And we also want to rule out things that we say they're not a bug, but they really are. We also want to verify that the defect itself is not a duplicate. That's another reason for having a database. We don't want 20 different copies of the same bug, but only because 20 different people call in and say, hey, by the way, do you know when you hit this button when this is depressed that the system crashes? Like, well, yeah, we do know that, but thanks for reporting anyway. <laughs> So once we've ruled out the false positives and false negatives and we've verified that the defect is not in fact a duplicate, then an entry needs to be made into whatever database or other tool is being used for tracking software defects. And if, you, if you're going to be doing this at sort of a corporate level, you'll probably want to get something a little bit more sophisticated than just sort of a simple database. Now, it is possible to simply create a spreadsheet with a, a column that says, here's the bug, here's the severity level, here's the user that it's been assigned to, and all that sort of stuff. But there are explicit uh, tools that are built on top of a database that allow you to do defect tracking. You also want to be able to preserve the uniqueness or anonymity and the granularity of the defects. Now, the animicity means that the def that each individual defect is a separate item. That one defect doesn't get broken up into a whole bunch of sub defects. Um, now, it is true that one defect may be the result of several different entities, but if in fact one defect is the result of several different sub entities, then you need to fix each several different item individually. So, you want to be able to preserve the fact that here is a defect that gets fixed, and then if that defect f being fixed results in a couple of other items having to be fixed, then you need to keep track of those as well. When a defect gets reported, then you report it in the following fashion. Keep track of the subject heading, which is be the name of the defect or something like that, the build version of the software that has the defect, what operating system and what configuration it is, and then any attachments. For example, there might be a data dump, there might be a screenshot, any information that is helpful in replicating the bug or other defect. How reproducible is the bug? In other words, what steps do you have to take to regenerate the defect? What category does the defect fall into? Is it minor? Is it moderate? Is it major? Is it showstoppers? What category do you put it in? And what's the mechanism for resolving it? You also might have another category that says who you're assigning it to. What level of priority do we put on each defect? As we said earlier, the ultimate level is a showstopper, as in when you do this, this causes the entire application to crash. This is a top level top priority uh, bug, you got to fix this one. Uh, this is a level one problem. Then the next one might be, next level might be urgent. Now, you might say, what could be more urgent than an urgent one? <laughs> uh, you might say that it's urgent, but it doesn't actually cause the application to crash. That, that would be a showstopper. Then after urgent, then you might say it's high priority, medium priority, low priority, or not applicable, or just real minor, just 
just something that we observed and might be for future releases. So some levels of defect prioritization. But you need to have some way of deciding, okay, which are the ones that need to be fixed first. So there's sort of a level of severity rating. In an ideal world, defects will, software defects will not reoccur. But we live in a real world, not an ideal world. So you need to come up with an algorithm that says, how should reoccurring defects be handled? So that if a defect occurs, and then you close it, and then it reoccurs, how should they be handled? And what are the implications of reoccurring defects? Because remember, we're talking about software quality assurance, and we're talking about creating high quality software. So if, for example, a defect is reported, you fix it, you close the defect, and then the defect occurs again, then that implies that somewhere there's been a degradation in the quality of the software. Now, it could be because we had one of those regression testing gaps where we accidentally introduced a bug in a fix, and because of our regression testing, we didn't test that area um, in a release. So that could be an implication of a reoccurring defect. We didn't test a particular area, so we didn't find that. And so we went from build 5 to 5.1 to 5.2 to 5.3 or something like that. Um, and we didn't, get, we didn't find out about a bug that we fixed in 5.0 and unfixed, so to speak, in 5.1. We didn't find out about until 5.3. Or the reoccurring defect may be due to something entirely new that came up in 5.3. I don't know. So what are the implications of a reoccurring defect? Maybe a change in configuration. Maybe a problem with development. Any one of those could be an issue. So one of the parts of your test plan should be how should reoccurring defects be handled and what are the implications of reoccurring defects. Usually they mean there's a problem with your configuration or there's a problem with your development, or both. When should we analyze and close a particular defect? Speaking of closure, defects may be closed when one of the following occurs. When a defect has been corrected and verified. When a reported defect has been found not, in fact, <laughs> to be a defect. Sometimes users call in and say, this software is doing blah, 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 and it's not supposed to be doing this. And you go back and look at the requirements and say, this is what it's supposed to be doing. The requirements say it's supposed to be doing this. Well, I don't want it to do that. Well, that's what it's supposed to be doing. A defect may also be closed when it's found to be a duplicate of an existing defect. Sometimes, despite our best efforts, or maybe because of the way in which it was entered into the database, a defect is found to be a duplicate of an existing defect. So if you, you can close that or merge it into an existing defect. So if the defect is corrected, found not to be a defect, or found to be a duplicate of an existing defect, you may close a particular defect. Note that although we close defects that are corrected duplicates of existing ones or found not to be ones, a defect should never be removed from the database. One of the reasons for not removing a defect from the database is that analyzing the number and frequency of defects can help to determine when you should generate a new build. For instance, one algorithm might say that looking at the number of defects is that you should regenerate a new build every hundred or every thousand defects that go into the database. So that's one of the algorithms that are used, that can be used to help make that determination. Is every hundred or every thousand defect reports go in, that provides a new baseline number for generating uh, defect reports.
If you have questions or comments with regards to any of the content that's covered during this presentation, please use the question and comment box that's located below. Thank you for joining us during this presentation. I hope you found the information that's covered during this presentation to be both interesting and useful.